Welcome to the Cold Case Christianity Broadcast, the only Christian case-making program hosted by a cold case homicide detective. J. Warner Wallace has been investigating cold case murders in Los Angeles County for over a decade. His work has been featured on Fox News, Court TV, and Dateline. For more information about Jim's work and the case for Christianity, please visit coldcasechristianity.com. Now, here's your host, J. Warner Wallace. Thanks for joining us at Cold Case Christianity. I'm Jay Warner Wallace. Uh, this week, I want to talk about uh, the rich, uh, robust, evidential history of Christianity and our duty, really, to um, be a part of that rich, evidential history. Uh, if you're watching this show and you're watching other shows on NRB TV, you probably know that this is a network that values the life of the mind, right? And you see there are lots of shows here that really talk about the deeper things, the evidences, the issues related to culture, uh, offers more than a proposition that Christianity is true, and instead actually offers evidence to support why we believe it's true. So you're probably already interested in this kind of thing if you're watching this network to begin with. Uh, but you may have experienced some difficulty in communicating the importance of an ev evidential approach to others in your church, in your family who are Christians, other believers in general, and that's not actually all that uncommon. I've experienced this myself, and at times it has been frustrating to help others to see, especially uh, coming to faith late in life. I was 35 when I became interested in Christianity and examined the evidence of the New Testament. And I encountered lots of Christians who had been Christians for a lot longer than me. Some of these folks were raised in the church. Some of them um, really can't remember a time in which they weren't active in church, or they would tell me that they had a, a conversion experience uh, in their teenage years. So they really f spent more time uh, as humans on planet Earth as Christians than as not Christians. And so for these folks, uh, they took a lot of this stuff uh, without really um, challenging much of it. I, I knew I, I came in a different way. I, I, I came in kind of dragging my feet, kind of kicking against uh, the, the propositions of Christianity and testing each one of them evidentially. I had a very different entry uh, process. And as a result, I think I was probably still a little bit more skeptical and evidential even as a Christian than many of the people that were in my church that I met as Christians after becoming a Christian. So... But you may have had a similar experience where you've uh, realized the value and the role of evidence in your own Christian walk, but maybe you've had a difficult time uh, communicating that to others. Or maybe uh, you're somebody who is in that other category where you've never really thought about your faith that way. And now that you're in a culture that's maybe testing what we believe more than ever before and really kind of grounds their uh, beliefs and want to ground their beliefs in evidence and the, the rules of science and all the kind of empiricist views of, of truth, uh, you may find it more and more difficult to share what you believe with others, especially your own kids. If they are becoming uh, teenagers and uh, approaching college, you know that there's a time, really now is the time, for us as parents in those years to help our kids, equip our kids evidentially, so that there's a season in which they want to explore uh, and do stupid, which all of us do uh, at some point in our young lives, they will at least know that the Christian worldview is evidentially true. Like we always say, if uh, students want to run off and do uh, silly things while they are uh, in college because they want to pursue their passions, I get that, that's on them, but if they're going to run off and run away from the Christian world because they don't believe it's any longer, it's true any longer, they don't think it's evidentially true, well that's really on me as their parent for not properly equipping them with the truth. I want my students and my own kids, if they uh, run off for a season, to run off knowing that they're really in rebellion. And they're kicking against not just my teaching or not my, my desires as their parent or as their youth pastor, but really against the truth. They are kicking against the truth. And, and, and they really kind of know that. They've got the case for that in their head. They've, it's already been demonstrated to them. That kind of training, that kind of Christian upbringing will eventually bring kids back to faith, bring, bring kids back to the church bring all of us back to the truth because if you really know it's true, there's only so long you can go. I call that rubber band theology, right? You can stretch away and pull away and pull away, but the further you pull, the more this sting when you return. So if you're smart, you don't get too far away from home. So what I want to do in this episode is remind you, number one, of why evidence was so important to me. Remember, there are a couple of ways to come at a claim. 
uh, you can, you'll see, I'm going to show you an illustration from my new book. By the way, a lot of what I'm talking about in the next several weeks is from a book I've written called Forensic Faith. And this book, Forensic Faith, is really designed, it's written um, for those of us who are trying to, number one, either alter the way we've been thinking about faith, or if you already have a rich, kind of more reasonable, evidential uh, Christian worldview, Christian faith, this book, I hope, will help you to communicate that to others. In other words, where my other books were, either a case for Christianity and cold case Christianity, or a case for theism and God's crime scene, this book is a case for making the case. And that's something we're gonna to have to, I think, approach with our church family now that, uh, and I'll tell you why. If you think about the ways that most people will, will um, respond when asked, why are you a Christian? The vast majority will offer something experiential. Um, they will either say they've had an experience growing up in the church or they had an experience of some nature that confirmed for them that Christianity was true. Now, experience can lead you to truth, and here's a diagram, as I was referencing earlier, from the book Forensic Faith. Now, you'll see if you look at this diagram that there are two ways you can come at a truth claim. If you come at a truth claim from experience, that's a good way to come. Some experience is, is, a, is a, a form of evidence your own personal experience as an eyewitness, right? And that can lead you to truth. But you'll see there's another arrow here in this diagram. That can also lead you to error. And I know this because, unfortunately, um, I have family members who have had experiences, they say, led them to Mormonism. So your experience alone, if it's untested by the evidence, may lead you to the wrong place. Evidence has a much greater capacity to lead you to truth and kind of stir you away from what's not true. If you take an evidential approach, you can verify a claim and you can also falsify claims. So the great thing about taking an evidential approach to your worldview, if it's a, if it's a theistic worldview, is that it can, like your experience, lead you to truth. But unlike a, a purely experiential process, it can also protect you from error. And that has great value, right? When we're in a pluralistic uh, culture in which there are a number of ways, a number of, um, of worldviews offered, and all are offered as though they should have equal uh, platform, equal uh, merit, equal validity. And that kind of diverse, pluralistic culture, now more than ever, we need to guard ourselves from error, realize that these claims of these different religious worldviews are all um, making, are, are, are all contradictory. They're making different claims that cannot be reconciled about the nature of God and many other kinds of claims. So they can't all be true because they contradict each other. They could all be false or they could, or one of them could be true. <laughs> And it's up to us to decide, are they all false? Or is one of them true? And your experience alone won't always get that done. As it turns out, lucky for us, there is a rich evidential history in Christianity. And I want to share that with you on this episode. We'll take a quick break. And when we come back, we'll launch in to that rich Christian history. Be sure to visit the Cold Case Christianity website daily to read Jim's blog, watch the weekly video, or listen to the Cold Case Christianity podcast. You'll also find great free resources, including the free downloadable monthly Bible insert. While you're there, be sure to sign up for Jim's daily case note email. Cold Case Christianity is designed to help you become a better Christian case maker. Now I can remember um, when I uh, graduated from the police academy many years ago you know they have you raise your hand and take an oath and i was so happy to do that right you work so hard you know you're in this thing for four months in this academy and you're hoping someday to be able to raise your hand and take the oath to be a sworn police officer and that oath called us to a certain kind of commitment to duty and so i think most first responders who are called into this kind of a job even if you're not uh, religious or you're not uh, a theist, you don't believe in God, and I didn't back in those days, it would be another 10 years before I would become a Christian or, or so. And um, I think that even those of us who, who aren't believers understand the nature of duty and commitment, um, and I certainly did. 
and I was happy to, to take on that duty. As a matter of fact, I remember uh, in my graduation, I happened to end up as the honor cadet of that, that uh, class. That's the top graduating recruit in the class. And I was asked to come up and do a little speech. And afterwards, when I got out of that situation, that, that academy graduation, the very next day I was assigned to a patrol car with a training officer. And I realized suddenly that the, the achievement of being the honor recruit and also having been um, the son of a police officer who was already on the department were not actually benefits. They were, they were um, responsibilities and um, barriers. A lot of people resented me because they thought I had an unfair advantage because I had a dad who was on the, on the agency. They also thought, oh, this kid, I had a college degree. And back in those days, not a lot of people had a college degree coming into law enforcement. As a matter of fact, I had a master's degree before I even started. And uh, so a lot of people didn't really uh, thought, you know, who's this kid think he is? Oh, he thinks he's the son of, of Jim Wallace? Oh, he thinks he's an honor recruit? And uh, I, had, I found myself having to constantly prove that, number one, I was street smart enough to do this job, that I would get, could make tough decisions, that... Um, that uh, you know, this, the, the expectations were like super high. And I felt at times like all I could do was fail to meet these expectations. Now, if you're a Christian watching this show, you may feel similarly in the sense that we have a high responsibility. People expect stuff from us. If they know anything about Christianity, probably they don't start off, as, it doesn't start off as a plus, it starts off as a barrier, right? Where, where you've got to prove something. You're not just the son of the officer who was here before you. You're the son of the king. You claim to be part of this, uh, this uh, tribe of Christians, of Jesus' followers. Well, let's see if this guy responds the way, you know, what's, what's really different about this guy? Uh, if we push, if push comes to shove, does he end up acting like all the non-Christians? I mean, the expectations are high for us. And we have a sense that we're called to something different. We know that. And it's like a duty, the same kind of duty that first responders take on when we raise our hand and we swear in. Part of this, I think, is us trying to understand what is our duty as Christians. One of the things that struck me is, is and I didn't really expect this as an atheist reading the scriptures for the first time, was the high regard for intellect. Because, you know, as an atheist, you always think that Christians don't think. They don't understand evidence. They don't, they're clearly, they, they believe in miracles. They believe somebody could walk on water. They believe somebody could be in the belly of the whale for three days. They believe all these crazy things. So clearly they can't be thinkers. Yet, scripture over and over again asks us to use our minds. And it calls us to a review of the evidence to see why Christianity is true. As a matter of fact, we are called to worship God with more than just our voices. Here's an illustration again from the book, in which we are called to illust we are called to uh, worship God rather with more than just the stuff that you see in church on Sunday. You know, we go on Sunday, we we sing songs. Uh, we're called as part of our church family to. To, to serve, or maybe acts of service you see. We see these as acts of worship. When we, when we pray in a church setting, it's seen as very worshipful. We're, we're called to go obediently into the world in missions, and this is seen as an act of worship. But there's another way to love God that we know from the Scripture. Um, you know, th this, this is, I mean, we're called to love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your might. And there's a word there. This idea for um, for uh, uh, you know strength with all your all your might is a word that is talks about your it, it describes the mind and understanding and intelligence. We are called to love God with all of the strength of mind, all of our in intellectual ability. And what would that look like? I mean, is it just about thinking about God? Well, it's about Watching a show like this, when you could be watching something else, what you watch is a good indication of what you worship, what you spend your money on, what you spend your time doing. For those of you that are actually engaged in thinking deeply about the evidence for God's existence and always kind of working in your own mind through why the case is so strong and recalling the evidence, this, this is actually an act of worship. And you're just worshiping God in a different way. You're not singing the Psalms necessarily or praying the prayers, but you are worshiping God with your mind. And that's a part of the Christian worldview that is very unique, right? 
I mean, we are all, there's all kinds of worldviews that ask you to think. But there's a very uniquely evidential aspect to the Christian worldview. Let me illustrate it for you. If I was to say to you that God came to me and, and gave me a vision, uh, and he told me, uh, gave me three things that I am to tell you. So I'm right here I am. I'm going to tell you the three things that God wants you to hear. I think if you were me, especially before I was a Christian, I would have said, you know, you're nuts. I don't like, why would I believe that? Why would I believe for a second that God is giving you some vision? Well, you know, you would say, oh, look, I, I've had lots of visions from God. This is as real as any um, a physical uh, uh, observation I've ever made. This, I'm telling you, this vision occurred, and you can trust me on this. This is from God. I think if it was me, I mean, even now, as a believer, wouldn't you find at least a little bit of skepticism about that? Would you just jump out and say, okay, great, I want to hear what God has to say. I think I would, uh, really? Now, that's one way that someone can approach you. What if they approached you a different way? What if they came to you and said, hey, I got a message from God for you. And let me tell you what happened. Yesterday, God came to me in the form of a human and I'm not kidding. He sat in my backyard. We had lunch together. And I had two of my friends there. And I, he, he just appeared and he, he, he spoke to me at lunch in front of two of my friends. And then he looked over and saw how dry my grass is. We've had a wet year here in California. But, you know, say it was last year when we were in the middle of the drought. You know, and he said, hey, you know, I, I can help you with that irrigation. And he actually dug a trench for my water system. And then he saw that I had kids and I have a big tree in the backyard and he decided to build a tree house. And then he told me three things I'm here to tell you. Well, that second kind of claim is very different than the first kind of claim, right? The first kind of claim is just a, a, a vision you get to trust. It's very personal. It's very experiential. The other kind of claim is a public claim. The first kind of claim is a private experience. The second kind of claim is a public event. After all, there's people I could interview. Let me talk to your friends. Let me go to your backyard. Let me look and see if there's actually a trench dug in the ground. That treehouse is probably going to be pretty cool if it was designed by God. Let's go see it. In other words, and here's another illustration from Forensic Faith, the vast majority of religious worldviews are built on these kinds of private revelations. Just kind of trust that the, uh, the, the words that are in that scripture are either so... Um, some people will say they're so self-evidently divine that you would just have to trust that they came from God. The proverbial statements, for example, of Baha'u'llah and the Baha'i faith, I think would fall into this category. The other, but our Christian worldview is not like this. The claims of Christianity are public and they are grounded in an event, an historic event that occurred in history called the resurrection, actually the entire ministry of Jesus. And so now we, can, we can't really test private revelations and private experiences, but you can test historic events that have happened publicly. And that means that while some theistic worldviews really are impervious to an evidential approach, the Christian worldview is absolutely appropriate and and beautifully uh, crafted for an evidential approach because it's grounded in an event that we could examine evidentially. And that's what makes Christianity so special and part of the rich history, the rich evidential history of Christianity is really built on the nature of the claims having been uh, historically, having historically occurred in the past. Let's take a break. When we come back, I want to spend some time uh, just exploring that a little bit as we begin and, and continue to talk about the rich, robust, historical, uh, evidential uh, history of Christianity. Need a speaker for your next conference, retreat, training seminar, or church service? Jim travels around the country, making the case for the existence of God, the deity of Jesus, and the reliability of the Bible. He'd love to partner with you to create a powerful, transformational training experience. Just visit the Cold Case Christianity website and click the Book Me tab. You'll find everything you need to know there, including a list of Jim's speaking topics, promotional materials, Jim's speaking calendar, and a link to connect with our team so we can book your event. Okay, 
I want to walk you now quickly just a few minutes through the rich evidential history of Christianity. And I'm going to take it in steps because I think from start to finish, Christianity calls you and I as Christ followers to take an evidential approach. Let's begin with Jesus himself. Here's another diagram from Forensic Faith. And you'll see here that Christ the case maker is the very first example of evidentialism that we see. Our master was an evidentialist. If you don't uh, believe me, take a look at some of the scripture. In John chapter 5, he says, The testimony which I have is greater than the testimony of John. He talks about testimony, which is direct evidence, repeatedly. He'll say in John 10, If you don't believe what I'm telling you, believe on the evidence of these miracles. As a matter of fact, in Acts chapter 1, Jesus spends, according to Scripture, 40 days with the disciples after the resurrection, giving many convincing proofs. Think about that for a second. Really? You've already, what more than, the, what above the resurrection do you need to show me to prove that you are God? But he spent 40 days providing additional proofs, evidences, that he was who he said he was. And then, and one of the best episodes, I think, in all of Scripture, you have, and we've talked about in other episodes of, of Cold Case Christianity, you have John the Baptist, who's in custody, sending his disciples to Jesus, asking, he says, Jesus, John wants to know, he's locked up, he wants to know, are you the one? And that is the moment in which we can test how, the approach that Jesus would take. Because he has a, a chance there, an opportunity there to be very experiential. He could say, look, doesn't John know couldn't John just pray and ask us, pray for certainty, ask for wisdom? My Mormon family would say, James chapter 1, if we relax wisdom, can pray for it, and God will answer that prayer. Jesus could have taken that approach with John the Baptist. He could have scolded John the Baptist for not uh, trusting his experience of having grown up as Jesus' cousin. But don't forget, John's mother met Mary, and, and John leapt in the womb. Okay, so how is it you can't trust that this is true now? No, he didn't take any of that approach. Here's what he did. He worked three miracles in front of the disciples. And then he said, go back and tell John what you just saw. That, my friends, is a very evidential approach to answering the question, are you the one? He said, I'm going to show you some evidence. Go back and share with John what you just learned. And it's not just with Jesus. Let's take another step in the kind of rich evidential history of Christianity. And I'll put it up on the screen for you here as yet another diagram from Forensic Faith. So take a look at this one. The next step in this is not just Jesus that is an evidentialist. He's not alone. It's the people who he discipled, the people who he brought up, that he uh, uh, trained were also evidentialists. These are the uh, kind of commissioned case makers. These are the folks that you see over and over again. Uh, who are identifying themselves evidentially. They are identifying themselves as eyewitnesses. You see this in John's Gospel. You see Paul identifies himself as an eyewitness. Peter, in his letters, identifies himself. Hey, we're not making this stuff up. We are just people who saw it with our own eyes. As a matter of fact, let me tell you how important it was to be an eyewitness as an apostle. When Jesus ascended into heaven and they were replacing Judas in the upper room, remember, Matthias ends up being the person who replaces Judas. Well, what were the qualifications for that replacement of Judas? Well, he had to be somebody, according to Peter, who knew and uh, observed the uh, new Jesus and experienced uh, Jesus' ministry from the baptism to the resurrection. They were looking for what? They were looking for an eyewitness. Eyewitness status is incredibly important to the next step of Christian history, which is not just that Jesus is a, is a case maker, because of course he is, and he always presented himself evidentially, it's that the people he brought in as his disciples and commissioned these also. And if you read through the book of Acts, you'll see over and over again, the manner in which they actually um, uh, proclaim the gospel is entirely evidential. It was, hey, the Old Testament predicted this, and then we saw it come true with our own eyes. We are here as witnesses of his glory. Direct evidence. So, from Jesus to the commissioned disciples, you have a very evidential approach. Let's go one more step in Christian history with yet another diagram from uh, Forensic Faith. 
The next level is not just that the uh, disciples were themselves the commissioned case makers. It's that the, those who ended up writing the uh, scripture themselves, the canon of scripture, these folks were eyewitnesses. I want you to think about that for a second. There were a number of early um, uh, Christian uh, letters that were used in worship services by the earliest of Christians, the shepherd of Hermas, uh, first Clement. Clement was a student of Paul. These are letters that were actually, uh, the epistle of Barnabas. These are letters that uh, were used by, in early worship. Now, interestingly, they're not in your canon of scripture. What you do see in the canon of scripture are documents or letters of people who were either eyewitnesses directly or they were taking these they were scribing for the eyewitnesses now remember luke starts off as an eyewitness in the book of acts you see him slipping the first person there and he's speaking with other eyewitnesses to go backward and write the gospel of luke mark is scribing for the eyewitness named peter and every other book takes as his authority that it was written by somebody who was an eyewitness even paul says hey Aren't I like the other disciples? Didn't I also witness the risen Christ on the road to Damascus? Why make that case? Why even? Because that eyewitness status gave him the authority. Let's go one more step in Christian history with another diagram from the book. It's not just that it's Christ the case maker and the commissioned case makers of the disciples and the canonical authors that are also case makers. It's that they are our continuing case makers in early church history. As a matter of fact, some of the most uh, predominant and well-known Christians were case makers who were apologists defending the faith. I've got a list of them in the book and it doesn't stop there. One more diagram. Take a look you'll see here that there, we are called to be case makers. The contemporary case makers, you know this from Peter's letter in 1 Peter 3.15. You and I are called to make the case, to give the reason for the hope we have in Jesus. Well, we jammed a lot into a small piece of time here. But the rich evidential history of Christianity, you need to know it and learn it so you can communicate it to other believers. It'll change the way you live as a Christian. We'll talk more about that on the next episode right here at Cold Case Christianity. Thanks for joining us at the Cold Case Christianity broadcast. If you're interested in more information about this week's topic, please visit coldcasechristianity.com. For a thorough investigation of the reliability of the New Testament Gospels and the case for Christianity, be sure to purchase Cold Case Christianity, a homicide detective investigates the claims of the Gospels. It's available wherever books are sold.